Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to Wednesdays with Wyndon. I'm Madeline Gardner, I am Jazz Lincoln Center's PR and external comms manager. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in again this week. Uh, we have a lot of fun things come up, coming up at Jazz Lincoln Center online that I'd love to start off by talking with you about. In just a couple of minutes, Winton will be joining us for a Q&A. So if you wanna go ahead and ask all of your questions over here, we can uh, get started. And I wanna remind you quickly before uh, Winton joins us, that last week, last Wednesday, we premiered our gala, our worldwide concert for our culture on our YouTube, Facebook live stream. It was a really, really beautiful concert. You can still watch it on demand. It features Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra with Winston Marsalis and a bunch of other really incredible artists from around the globe. So you can head to jazz.org slash gala2020 to watch that. And I think Winton is here right now. Hi, Winston. All right, now. How you doing? How y'all feeling? Good. How are you doing? Good. Let me get my station set up right. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I want to start off by saying congratulations on the incredible, incredible worldwide concert for our culture. It was, I was watching it and I felt, it was like beaming with pride to be part of the jazz community. Not only jazz and Lincoln Center, but just the community in general it felt like a really powerful. Well, you know, thank you, Maddie. There's so many uh, great musicians from over, uh, along all over the world. We've been, many of us have been friends for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And it was a labor of love for them. They sent uh, tapes in and everything and a lot of time was spent on it. And uh, we are also grateful, not just me personally, because these are very personal relationships, but also Jazz and Lincoln Center as an organization. And ultimately jazz, because we were trying to represent and show the music that many of us have believed in and, and has been a part of our maturity since like in the case of Igor Bootman and I, we've known each other for, for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, it goes for Stefano De Battista and, and all, all the great musicians. And even the, the, the ones that I'm kind of new to knowing, like the Duzo Marcatini, the depth of, of love and respect. I mean, I'm maybe 15, 18 years older than the Duzo. So uh, the love that, that I have for, for him and how they played and what he's about, because he's also a teacher. And many of these musicians are also musicologists and teachers. Like Hamilton Jolanda, he, he, he's the a principal exponent in this time of Choro. He, he, he brought it back, talked about it, popularized it, uh, applied it to other forms. He's such a virtuoso and, and has such depth as a musician and as a human being. And I could go down the list of musicians and be just as uh, effusive in praise of them and still not be uh, be complimentary enough for the things that they've done in their their cultures and what they represent. So, I, w I was very proud too to work with them and uh, also of our, of our staff member. Got a chance to work with some of our younger members, um, you know, with 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 uh, with Adam and Chloe, and they they were up day and night working on it, trying to make it look uh, really really great. And of course, our engineer Ty White Lock. That's another thirty year. Mm -hmm. You know, another veteran that we and we I didn't realize that was Todd's son playing guitar, right? At uh, in Yardbirds, yeah, right? yeah. Oh, Wes, I love Wes. You know, I mean, of course, Todd and I have known each other so, so for so long. I knew knew Wes since he was a kid. But Todd and I were talking. And he said, hey, "It's the guitar part on this," and, and he's at home. Everybody's quarantined, and Wes is a great rhythm guitar player. I said, "Well, man, let, you know," he, I said, "Let Wes." He said, "Well, you want Wes to put it?" I said, "Put Wes in the video, man." And uh, you know everything is familiar. You know Todd, Todd is is, is a, a, an engineer that, that drove from Detroit to Los Angeles after 9/11 when we recorded All Rise with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. He drove uh, overnight nonstop to get to a recording session when the, when the country was shut down. So once again, long long standing relationships that we have. Uh, give an opportunity, Diane Reeves the opportunity to present something to the public with the type of love and depth of feeling and honesty and uh, and truthfulness that our, our, the best of our music always has has uh, with it. I watch that smile video over and over again. It just makes me feel, it makes you feel all, it makes me smile as, as corny as it might sound. It really does. No, not corny. I mean, it's, it's personal, you know. I, mm -hmm. That's why I think in the beginning I made the point that Diane had our entire band over to her home. And the meal she cooked for us was was for royalty, and she, it, was, it was by her own hand. And uh, she sat in our trumpet section in Denver. And we've the greatest performance we've ever had in Rose Hall was her singing Misty. We don't have a recording of it, 
but it was a few, couple of three or four years after we uh, opened the hall, and she sang this. It, it was so powerful, the performance, that those of us who were there in the hall that night, we still, we sometimes we talk about great performances we, we've heard, and we say, what about that Misty that, that Diane put on us that night? And the next night, she didn't do it. She did another song. She said, I'm not, I'm not going to mess with that one. And uh, it's also a chance to see that just the relationships we have is very personal. Well, thank you for sharing that with, with everyone uh, globally. And uh, um, it, something that I found really interesting to this past Monday during Skane's Domain, uh, which if everyone viewing, and if you don't know what that is, every Monday night um, at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Winton does a live Zoom, Facebook Live, and sometimes special guests pop by. And this one really focused on everyone tuning in which was really special because we had people from India where it was, I think it was seven, 6 a.m. or something and uh, tuned in to ask you a question. We had this one music, a music educator from, I believe it was the Bronx, who uh, talked to you about, you know, music education right now in this time of everything being virtual. So I want to kick things off by, by posing a similar question to what she was talking about. What advice do you have for parents, for educators who want to teach their kids uh, jazz appreciation during this time? from home? I think that uh, there are a lot of good things online. Of course, you can always go to Jazz and Lincoln Center's Jazz Academy. And I'm not saying it because it's ours, because I believe there are many great resources all over the world. I'm not really propri proprietary about things. Uh, people figure out things everywhere. And of course, in the, in, the, in the South Bronx, there's the great tradition of Afro-Latin music. You know, I, I was joking when I said, I'm going to bring Carlos down there. She thinks I'm joking, but we will come down there. Uh, because we're we're neighborhood people, you know. We come we come from the neighborhoods. Just the other, a few years ago, Carlos's mama was bringing him to rehearsals, and and uh, I think you know you get online. The best thing is is listening, and and when you start looking for resources, you're gonna find all kind of things that resonate with you. The beautiful thing about uh, getting online is one thing leads to another thing, leads to another thing, leads to another thing, and if you start with our jazz academy, you'll find other things that are not just jazz and Lincoln Center's. Because I don't want people to think I'm advertising. And speaking of that, I saw uh, the great Bobby Allende sent me a message, and uh, that is my absolute man. He's one of the great, great percussionists in the world, and a master of, of, of Afro-Latin styles of, of all levels of significance. And uh, I, I, I see his name there, so it, it, all, it made me happy. So what's happening, Poppy? Much love. <laughs> love and respect. I'll, I'll try to scroll up, too, and see what, uh, what he said here. But while I'm looking for that, I also, I saw it's today's Charles Mingus's uh, birthday. Uh, do you, what's your favorite uh, Mingus tune? Or do you have a, a memory of the first time you heard Mingus? And what was that, uh, that tune? Well, I can tell you a story. When I was, I don't know, 12 or 13, Mingus was playing in New Orleans at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. They played on the stage. I was sitting on the stage. And he and New Orleans drummer James Black. Mingus was known for having a volatile personality. But James Black, too. So I, could, I was sitting right behind the kind of drums and the bass, and they started arguing and fighting. <laughs> so so James, Mingus told James something James didn't like, and James started cussing, and, you know, he got into that thing. So I always think about it, just, just how funny it was, you know, the type of, of, of thing that they have. But I, I like uh, so many so many great pieces, Mingus. But I think I like um, Meditation on Integration because it has the kind of African six against and then he layers a long melody on top of that. Then he goes into different times. And, uh, you know, I loved him, Danny Richmond, uh, Charles McPherson. I mean, just the, that, that kind of iteration of Mingus. He wrote so, so much great music. The thing I really love about him is uh, his aspirations and dreams for the music and the fact that he's one of the, one of the few musicians who came from the post, what we call the bebop era, which divides the music uh, for those who don't know about the music into new and old or modern. And they have a tendency to think Charlie Parker is a dividing line. Mingus understood that he was not. So mm -hmm. Mingus thought early, he was calling himself Baron Mingus. And he understood the importance of New Orleans music, uh, uh, songs like My Jelly Roll Soul and just the way he used collective improvisation with the, the, what is called the avant-garde. Uh, Mingus is a fantastic, unbelievable conceptualist. And when you go through the checklist of things in jazz that give your music a comprehensive nature, like do you have improvising voices that, that speak polyphonically? Yes, he did that. Do you have different types of 
two grooves. And, and yes, do you have a relationship to the Afro-Latin tradition? He does, although unusually his comes through his relationship with Mexican music. And uh, did you do do you have an original concept of harmon harmonies? Even a song though it's popular, like "Goodbye Mr. Pork Pie Hat," that's that's a great progression on that song. The intelligence of the progression. Do you have an original concept of swinging? Yes, the way him and him and Danny were going through those different times, a third above the time, a third below the time, going to halftime. Fantastic way they played. Do you have an original concept of written counterpoint? Yes, he 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 had that. Do you have a way to, w w of writing ballads? Yes, unbelievable originality with writing ballads. So uh, the the intellectual quality of his his music is very very high, very insightful. Do you have a political consciousness? Yes, with things like fables of fathers, Mingus. How do you relate to other arts? Mingus also writing film scores and, and coming from from the kind of Los Angeles thing. He was always a uh, you know I could go on and on, but but I won't. He's yeah, Mingus was Mingus was uh, so for real. And I saw a question pop up as well. I had someone who's been trying to ask this question for the past couple couple uh, Wednesdays with Winton. They want to know, um, how does improvis improvisation play in classical music? OK, if you take take the early forms of, of classical music, there was more group improvisation, coherent group improvisation. Just in, 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 the, in the early Baroque, the playing of a figured bass. You have to think written music always goes the same way. If you take the way it went in jazz, it went that way in classical music. First, you have people who can play because it's much easier to play than it is to write. Mm -hmm. It's easier to speak than it is to write. People were talking before they started writing. Then you start to write down what you are playing. When a person composes, they're, they're improvising because they, they play something and they write it down. And if they don't play it, they sing it and they write it down. If they don't sing it, they hear it and they, they give order and shape and form to it and they write it down. As time passed, classical music, classical music became more uh, more, more specialized. And this is a thing that's happened in, in, in life. Like my, my little brother always makes me laugh because he says people talk about the Mayan calendar it's, as, as an example of the sophistication of the Mayan culture. He says, how many people do you think could understood in the Mayan times, how many people in that culture understood the Mayan calendar? He said, okay, how many people did you know understand how the space shuttle works? <laughs> that's about the same percentage of people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, as, as as music became more specialized and more and more people did things of a, of, of a diversity, the composer improviser started to drop into the background. I, I, I have a tendency to think we should try to keep all aspects of traditions going all the time. Uh, but there's a way of thinking that, tra tra that traditions progress by discarding things that are no longer useful and that you're not going to miss some of those things that are useful. Because in actuality, we do evolve by discarding things we don't need. But I will take just the, the, the progression of jazz. Do we not need three horn counterpoint anymore? Do we not need people soloing together like they do in New Orleans music? Do we not need a march feeling in our music that makes people jubilant? Do we not need a good two groove or something that allows you to have the, do we not need people dancing to our music? Do some things we discard, I wonder, well, and the same thing is true in classical music. What, is it better, is it more beneficial for the, for the music that people don't clap between movements? Is it more beneficial for the music that there's not more social engagement around, around the music that is more just kind of, is that what the musicians wanted? Or is it something that Gustav Mahler said we should do in, eight, in 1907? Or, so we have to always look at the totality of our traditions and look at our great musicians and what this, what their symbol teaches us. I'm fond of saying in this time that because we are put in a position of humility because we are no longer able to earn a living if we are musicians, let's go back and see the things Bach had to write to people to write music. And you'll see the type of, of humility and obsequiousness. You, you think, I remember in high school when I first would read Bach's things, he, would write, he wrote to his... Uh, sponsors i thought man this guy's this is this is bach this is like what he has to do and uh we have to access that same thing in this time so that's a long answer to that to that question i know but yeah. i think people still improvise and i think that it's something that uh if the, that the classical musicians would be we would all be better off if we did improvise it's, it's a it's a skill that's not really mysterious it's like talking 
And how, another question relating to that I saw come in, how do you uh, practice or how, how do you learn and now continue to practice feeling and being relaxed when you play? You know, it's a, a thing about you, one thing you cannot practice, I think, is the pressure of being in front of people. Mm. In your house, you can be very relaxed. You give us talk, you can, act, you can act silly, crazy in your home, you're relaxed. When you get in front of people, how do you practice that? You know, I wish I, and, and with, with me and my time of playing, sometimes I could have like really big concerts. I would have absolutely no nervousness or, or worry about it. And on that same tour, I could play in a place that's a, a small unheralded place and I'll go out that night and I'll be very conscious of people and be wanting to play perfect and be nervous. I never could, could understand it. Of course, never nervous like, a, like getting on a plane but because I'm afraid to do that. Mm. But when you're in front of people, it's hard to relax. And I think breathing helps you. And also when you place yourself in the actual context you're in, it makes you relax. I, I will tell you one story about when I played, I won a concerto competition that played with the New Orleans Philharmonic when I was 14. It was, it was such a remote thing to do if you were where I was from. I was playing a funk band at that time. And I grew up around musicians with my father, but now I had to play with an orchestra. So I'm backstage before having to walk out and play the Haydn from the concerto. And I'm unbelievably nervous. And then the orchestra manager was a, was a, a beautiful lady named Miriam Yardumian. <laughs> she came backstage and she saw me and she started teasing me. She said, are you nervous? Now, of course, I got my afro. I'm trying to be cool. Nervous now. <laughs> and she said, you're nervous. I said, I'm not, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was nervous. She said, look outside. So I looked out the window. I I'll never forget it. <laughs> the theater we were in. She said, look out the window. I looked out the window. She said, you see all of those people? People were walking around. She said, none of those people know that you're here and they won't know how you play and none of them are going to care. Now think about how many people there are in the world. Nothing rests on this except how you feel about yourself. Do the best you can to sound good and keep it moving. <laughs> so <laughs> I, you know, I thought about Miriam so many times and then she became the orchestra manager of Baltimore Symphony. I would see her down through the through that through the years. I don't know, it's been two or three years since I since I last saw her. But I always always love her and laugh about that. And I think uh if you can put yourself in the broadest context, it, it helps you to relax because even even you take something as meaningless as sports, how much meaning we put on it. Mm -hmm. I remember once being in a in an elevator with Marcus Allen, great running back from the from the from the Oakland Raiders, and a guy got on the elevator and said, Marcus Allen, you cost me a pile of money one day. It was very aggressive towards me. I thought, man, you know, you talk to this guy out there. Marcus Allen looked at him before he got off the elevator, and he said, you shouldn't have bet. <laughs> and when he walked off the elevator, I said, man, people approach you like that? He said, wow. all the time, all the time. He said, you need to get a life, man. That was some game that happened 18 years ago. So, you know, it's, for some reason, with many things, the more trivial something is, the more significance we, we, we give to it. Mm -hmm. And I think our own performances and our own achievements in front of people, the, the world is not hinged on on, a, on your concerto. Just just entertain people and play to the best of your ability. And, and, and you know, go home. Do the best you can do. Try to touch people. And, and, of course, it's easier to say than it is to do, but I find that that way of looking at stuff tends to help with a, with a, with a, with a nerve-wracking situation. That's fantastic advice. I think a lot, it's, it's kind of hard to to feel that when you're there, but to keep that in your head. Yeah, the nerves are real. Mm -hmm. Not anybody who tells you, oh, you know, when you're in front of people, you know. My Condoleezza Rice told me a funny story that I always, I always like to say, she said that whenever she would have a, she's a, she's a concert pianist, so she said whenever she had a big speech to give, as she walked on the stage being nervous about the speech, as she walked out to give the speech, she would say to herself, thank God I'm not playing the piano. <laughs> so, that's pretty great. Um, talking about playing the piano as well, I actually watched earlier the JLCO plays uh, Bernstein, which was, we. If, if you don't know, everyone viewing right now, um, every Wednesday, Jazzing and Center is releasing concerts from the, uh, from the vault. And today it was Jazzing Center plays Leonard Bernstein, one of my favorite, favorite composers. Uh, soft Spot for West Side Story, one of, one of the best shows. <laughs> 
And mm -hmm. so do you have, uh, from that concert or from any time, you know, playing any of the, his wonderful music, what is one of your favorite tunes that you've played of his? I think, you know, I loved him personally and, and knew him. I played under him when I was 17 at Tanglewood. That summer, we all couldn't wait for Bernstein to come in. We played Prokofiev Fifth Symphony. And I never forget how electric he was just as a conductor, how inspired. We all, we all were young people, age uh, 17. I was 17, it was 17 to 25, the orchestra. And it was such a transformative experience for me. What he represented in the culture and the, of course the excellence and the expertise, all the years of the young people's concerts and speaking with him, his level of engagement about music and his seriousness about all, many forms of American music. Mm -hmm. Of course, anybody in, in my, uh, my my age, we grew up playing West Side Story and, and seeing it on television. And we knew how famous and iconic it was and still is in the American theater bridges. So many, so many, so many gaps and gulfs and errors. And, mm. and uh, uh, he and Stephen Sondheim, you know, the kind of electric kind of team of younger people at that time, creating this, this whole new sound for the form. And, uh, I, I played many of his pieces and, and, and loved a lot of a lot of his pieces in him. When I was trying to do young people's concerts, I would talk with him. He was was always very forthcoming. After he passed away, even his family let me see all of his scripts and were willing to help in any way. And he was very dynamic. So I think of that concert, I loved Lament. It's a, it's a, a um, it was arranged by Vincent Gardner. Marcus Prentup is playing, and Walter plays in the section. I love that, but I love a lot of his music. I mean, it's it's so so insightful, and it's such a such a kind of cross slice of Americana, and it's also music that has a great deal of optimism and craftsmanship. Mm. And uh, he's he, he's deeply engaged with music on many many levels. And when you spoke with him, you always got a very broad perspective. And he was always for with me, very forthcoming with information and and with uh, with knowledge. Beautiful, and also on the on the kind of the same piano player uh, uh, note, how might a piano player develop a sound like a horn player can develop a sound? <laughs> mm. You know, um, we got we have to get we got to get some of our piano experts up here. We get a great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to tell you something wrong. I, I tend to be a person. <laughs> I don't think that's a wrong answer. There. I just, I, I don't know that the, this outside of, I like the way Monk plays the piano. I think he's the closest of what I've heard to piano players that can make notes bend. And I, I go, tend to go with auditory. And I would, I would tend to think, if you think like, like a child thinks and a person who is not taught that there are a limitation, I think that you can come up with a way to create sounds like a, Elvin Jones once said he was listening to records, a record, and it had two drummers playing. And he didn't know it was two drummers. So he started playing things that two drummers were playing. And so he developed another way of playing. And I think if you think of the piano as an instrument that can bend and moan and creak and cry, and you can get your mind into the framework of like a five-year-old or six-year-old who's just discovering what a piano is and is only listening to people moan and cry and holler and shout and all the things we do with our voices. And you start looking at that instrument thinking, how can I make this instrument do that? You start taking notes out and playing distances for a fraction of a second and you start doing things that no one would, a person would not normally do. You get a symbiotic relationship with the instrument. Um, I can remember be, talking with the great, race car driver, Jackie Stewart. And one of the most profound kind of observations that in a film, in a film he, 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 he made, he, he, I was talking about, he said something in the film about he had to work with a car so that when he was going really fast around a turn or something, he had to also accommodate the, the car, what it wanted to do. So I was talking with him, I said, what did you mean by that? He said, though a thing is inanimate, when you put it in motion, it is animated and it has a, a physical reality. And you can't impose your will on its physical reality because this instrument has a weight, a mass, a body. And because it's in motion, it also has a trajectory and momentum and it has a, a thing it wants to do. And when you start asking it to do something, you have to treat it just like a person. Some things I ask you to do, you're going to do. If I ask you to do something beyond what you're going to do, me and you are going to fight. He said in the automobile, that fight is going to be very brief and you're not going to win that. So I think inanimate objects, something like a piano, to make it come to life, that type of thinking like what Jackie uh, uh, exhibited about an automobile, 
And that, that's why he's such a great champion. Wow. That's an incredible story. Yeah. We have people, oh, everyone from tuning in once again around the globe, everyone from Brazil wants to say hi. From Chile, yes, want to say hello. Everyone sending their love, their talk about sharing your stories. Yeah, and there's a lot of people mentioning uh, Ken Burns' masterpiece, Jazz. Do you remember uh, filming? I know you've, you've collabed with, obviously, Ken Burns many times before, but can you, can you talk about that collaboration, working with him on that? Well, he's, he's, uh, he works so hard. He's so unbelievably serious and intense. And f for me, I have to just, I have to just smile at it. <laughs> I have to just laugh. I mean, I just, I, I just look over at him like, <laughs> it's, it's hard to even explain to you just the, the intensity that he comes with mm -hmm. and the directness that he speaks with and how clear he is with his vision of what he wants to do once he determines it and how many inputs he takes. Man, he's listening to everybody's opinion, everything everybody's thinking. He's writing everything down. It's something you can't believe. Like, when he says it took him 10 years to to work on a film, he's not talking about eight years of sitting around in two years. He's talking about 10 years of full out running a marathon like it's a sprint. Mm -hmm. And the kind of, uh, the way he works, it, it's like always fascinated with he and Jeff Ward, who writes, who has written a lot of his, uh, of his great films, the way the two of them can work together because they both are, are geniuses in their own right. But it's Ken's film, so he has the final say on a lot of stuff. <laughs> and he's, you know, it's like that he can keep that that level of of, of partnership going that long, mm. and that the two of them can figure out how to work. It's one of the great partnerships in the history of American art. And I learned so much watching him, not just on jazz. On, on you take your pick, Vietnam, the war. Mm. National Park, so I mean, it doesn't matter which, which, which of him. And, and what the respect I have for him, I mean, I've known him for a long time, I love him. The first time I saw him, I went to a speech he gave at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and this was 1988 or 89, it was a long time ago. I waited till after the speech, I introduced myself to him, and we, we, became, we started a, a kind of friendship talking back and forth. I was always saying then lobbying for jazz, because this was, right after the Civil War came out. So it might have been 90, I don't know the exact year, but it was in there. I was like, man, you gotta do one on jazz, you gotta do one on jazz. And, but in that time, not just about jazz, just seeing him and his process and how meticulous he is, but also how spontaneous and how free he is, a lot like a jazz musician mm -hmm. and how he's able to work with, with an unbelievably high level uh, collaborators. Lynn Novick, you know, just, they, and they worked together for years, they stay together. Right. It's, I mean, it's, it's a Paul Barnes, who was the music editor. No, no longer Paul retired, but just they were up, so they're on, they, they are on such a high level and they work on such a high level and they're so dedicated and it goes so far beyond anything you can, you can imagine. Like you can't, all you can do is laugh. Like, you know, he's obsessed with that. And that's why he stays like a boy. Yeah. When you're around him, he's like a child. Like he's like, man, guess what I, you know, the energy level of him is, he can't keep still, and when you and you know, of course, we're 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 unbelievably good friends now. We'll sit down and have a, we're having a breakfast, and he and I are talking about like some political issue, and the whole time maybe thirty minutes, and he's just, you know. But you know, here's the thing: you got to remember, don't forget that. You know what I mean? <laughs> just the excitement that he'll come with. Hey, this is like you know, nine thirty in the morning in the middle of, so yeah, you know, you're talking to, kind of the person in the in the front seat of Kim Burns fan club and, and it's once again 30 year relationship so yeah I, you know he's yeah he's he's for real he, he's <laughs> he's absolutely for real Trust, believe me he's not playing he's putting in those hours <laughs> i i think to to make all the this documentaries which are each i don't what, up six eight hours each i can only imagine all the work and dedication that goes into those if you just could see the chart on his wall of those six hours, <laughs> you can't imagine it. If you see like the inputs, just what he's looking at and how how, how a year of just, Amazing. It's, it's, it, if, you, if you didn't have respect, you will have a, a whole lot of it. And you'll understand why all that carping and talking everybody does. Yeah, you know, okay, you talk about him, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. He can't do everything. He's supposed to print, present you with the actual history of the thing he's, mm. he's doing as a film. The, the work he does is, oof, you make your film, 
And when you get into that fourth or fifth year, I'm going to see if you're still up at two or three in the morning after waking up at five or six. Then we can talk about him. Yeah. <laughs> like, like my father <laughs> said, my father always said, son, the best critique is always demonstration. Mm. That's a that's a wise, wise, uh, you know, saying right there. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell to... me. Show me. Mm hmm. And talking about showing, uh, how, what, what's your advice for people who would like to support not, you know, jazz musicians, any musicians during this time? Get online and find out where you can give people some money. This is old school. We don't have the ability to make money. There's not people sitting around who don't want to work. People want to work. You know, with the Louis Armstrong uh, Foundation, we, st we started a fund. We, we are giving away a million dollars of Louis Armstrong's money and thousand dollar grants to, to a thousand jazz musicians, freelance musicians who truly have no livelihood. Now with our city being locked down all of June, we're still looking to get funds. If you want to support musicians through that fund, uh, just, just go online. Louis Armstrong Musicians Fund, the emergency fund due to, due to uh, coronavirus. It's, it's, a, it's a, a need that musicians and artists have all over the world. Um, I, I'm, I support all the causes in the arts. And it, for our fund, it's not the level you are as a musician. We're not checking people to see, well, this one can play. It's not a competition. It's, if you're a jazz musician and you're freelancing in the New York area and you live in this tri-state area, we're trying to get funds to you because we, we, we're just getting you enough. You can get you some groceries. We just don't want you starving. And this is a, this is a, this is a rough situation for a lot of people. So if you if you have if you find yourself doing well because not all industries are, are shut down we're all on different levels of uh, resources and capabilities reach into your pocket I always say to people my father didn't have any money but he was a philanthropist he gave people some people he gave lessons for free he was always there in the community my mom was always had people in the house always teaching people stuff and and, and when people didn't have money my trumpet lessons with the great John Longo the agreement at that time was okay John. I'm gonna give you piano lessons and you teach my son. Okay, then he, John never got the piano lessons. He said, okay, give me $5. Sometimes he didn't get that $5. So John was a philanthropist and he taught me many times for nothing. Uh, for that, I'm forever grateful. And when I teach people I have the means, I just teach them. If I didn't, I would charge. It's, it's just so, it's just how we work our balance out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we need help. We have to survive. Even a, a large organization like Jazz and Lincoln Center, we lost all ability to earn revenue. And think about a, a, a musician that's freelancing. The, hey, these are hard gigs, and these are extremely hard times. It, it's not, a, and people are proud. So it's not help. Whoever you can help, help them. And whatever the amount, twenty dollars. Don't think an amount is too small. Anything will help. Well, on that, thank you so much for, for sharing. And thank you for, for your time today, Winston. And before I, I kick it back to you to, to wrap things up, I wanted to thank everyone for tuning in and really everyone for, for your support during this time. Um, you can head to jazz.org. We have a ton of free global uh, um, programs, uh, education events, and, and different Zoom classes you can take for free online. You can just head to jazz.org. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also watch the, uh, what was the premiere last Wednesday of the Worldwide Concert for Our Culture, which uh, was with, uh, featuring Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra with Wynn Marsalis, it was along with amazing, amazing musicians from around the globe. So you can head to jazz.org for that. So thank you again, Wynton, for taking the time. Thanks. Always so great to see you. And I want to just you. let you uh, wrap it up. Anything else you want to say? All right. Thank you, Maddie. You know, it's always good to see you. And uh, you always make me feel better just, you know, seeing the kind of effusive the vibe you have. It's always so upbeat. You. And uh, we need that in these times. And that's your natural personality. So, I, you know, I love seeing it. And, uh, you know, my thing is just thanks to everybody. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, this is a time that's, that's testing a lot of us to different degrees. Let's be our best selves. Let's help everybody we, we can. And if we're not in a position to help somebody, let's ask for help. And, uh, and thank you all. Much love till I see you, till we meet again. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. See you soon. All right. Much love.